Okay, so let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, so everyone actually knows Yoshua Benjo. So Yoshua is one of the pioneers of Deep Neural Network with Jeff Hinton and Yann Lequin. He needs no introduction. He currently leads the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, which is the largest worldwide concentration of academic researchers on deep neural networks. And I'm really happy that we have Yoshua today because in his recent research, he has shown an interest in making deep learning more hardware friendly. So I'm looking forward to hearing his talk. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to talk about two subjects. First, uh, briefly about some of the work we've done uh, for quantizing both the weights and the activations, and then some uh, more uh, crazy stuff that uh, I'm working on uh, that may have an impact on uh, analog implementations of, of deep nets. Uh, and um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I co-authored a book called Deep Learning, which uh, I just learned was uh, sold already 26,000 times. Uh, and that's very strange because there's like much more than the number of people who can probably read it, but anyways. Um, and uh, lots of things are happening in Canada, in, in Montreal and Toronto, uh, in terms of uh, deep learning and AI. So there's uh, lots of uh, jobs, openings, uh, in terms of faculty positions, researchers, um, students, uh, companies like Element AI, Maluba, Google, Facebook are all uh, hiring. So, uh, you know, please look our way and uh, there's gonna be a lot of exciting things happening. Okay, now, uh, why uh, do I care about uh, these questions I'm gonna tell you about? Uh, I think there's uh, interesting synergies between hardware, brains, and how we should design learning algorithms. Uh, and that uh, we can uh, use, in, in my case, the knowledge of uh, the, the underlying deep learning to do a better job of uh, helping the hardware people uh, design things that are gonna work better for them and for us later, uh, and also uh, somehow connect with some of the ideas uh, coming out of uh, trying to understand the brain. Um, so there, uh, I won't talk much about it today, but one of the things that um, is important to say is that brains are able to uh, do things that we're not able to do at all, uh, especially in terms of unsupervised learning, um, and in terms, of course, in terms of um, uh, energy efficiency. So uh, uh, let me say a few words about the quantization approach that uh, we've been doing in the last few years. Uh, it started uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, mostly with the work of Mathieu Corbario. And we started with uh, Binary Connect, which was eventually published at NIPS 2015, where we uh, binarized the, um, um, the weights, but we do it in such a way that the network is trained with that kind of binarization, where we think of the binarization as a form of noise. And so the, uh, we can actually uh, approximately backprop through that quantization. Uh, and, um, and so the, 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 there's no need to have a separate phase in which uh, a, a normal network is going to be compressed into uh, quantized representation. And that means the network is gonna be robust to these changes, gonna be trained uh, it, maybe to a different kind of solution than the kind of solution you would get if you train it with uh, 32 bits and then try to uh, quantize. Uh, more recently, we've worked on the binarization of the uh, activities, the activations. So instead of uh, real values, we'd like them to be uh, one or two bits or something like that. Um, so uh, we found that uh, it really made a big difference when we are able to train with this kind of uh, noise, either in the weights or in the activations, uh, compared to the earlier work we had done where we were trying to uh, quantize after the fact, uh, where we were able to go down to something like eight bits, uh, whereas if you train really your, uh, your network with that kind of quantization noise, you're able to go down to one or two bits. Um, so that's, um, that's the idea. I'm not gonna spend too much time on these things. Of course, we've done a lot of experiments. The most recent work with, um, uh, one bit weights and one bit states. Uh, you have some, some numbers here on MNIST, SVHN, CIFAR 10, AlexNet. So you see uh, a little bit of degradation, in some cases actually an improvement because the quantization can be seen as a regularization. 
Uh, and also, uh, in the last case for the AlexNet, you see um, that if we go from one-bit states to two-bit states, you, you, you get a significant improvement. So there's, there's a margin, you know, uh, trade-off between the amount of quantization and, and the amount of accuracy you can get. Uh, we've also played a little bit uh, with uh, using these things with current hardware, which of course is not optimal, just uh, uh, rewriting some uh, low-level GPU code to take advantage of the fact that we can now do all these uh, bit level operations in parallel, like we can do 32 bits, uh, multiply ads uh, at the same time. Uh, and 32 neurons can you know, uh, be, be computed uh, as one uh, GPU operation using the XNOR uh, computation. And so we can get a speed up of something like 7x uh, on a GPU without losing um, in terms of uh, accuracy here. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on this because the main thing I want to tell you about is uh, a little bit of a crazy path that I've started last year, uh, initially motivated by trying to bridge the gap between backprop and, um, and the brain. And that was just published last month in Frontiers in Neuroscience, but I think that these ideas could have a uh, potentially big impact in analog implementations uh, of neural nets. So we call this equilibrium propagation, but this is only the first version of the idea. And we're working already on the second version, which I think is going to be even more hardware friendly. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't need to tell you about the energy efficiency of the brain, 500,000x compared to uh, P100 GPU. Um, and also the, the unsupervised learning problem. Let's go directly to the more interesting things. Um, uh, one thing that uh, maybe some people here don't know is that a lot of the deep learning uh, methods over the last uh, decade and a half really were inspired by the brain. So this is true of RBMs, which people have forgotten today, but Covnets, of course, uh, ReLUs, I think many, many people don't know about this, but the, the, the piecewise linearity is something that's been known to neuroscientists as a, as a plausible model of computation in the brain. Um, and uh, um, that we showed in 2011 was actually helping to train deeper nets. Um, so we want to continue looking at uh, biology for inspiration. And, and in this case, we were looking at in particular uh, spike timing dependent plasticity uh, and kind of sort of local learning rules uh, as, as uh, an inspiration and trying to think, you know, can we frame that in a, a machine learning um, uh, justification, justifiable terms. So um, as, as a sort of background, if you think about uh, backprop uh, as, a, as a something that the brain could implement, uh, of course, for a long time, people have been saying, well, backprop is not biologically plausible. But if you look more carefully, uh, maybe you don't need to do that much, that much work to make it biologically plausible. It's still something that's an open question. Um, and so what, why, is, why is it that backprop is not biologically plausible? Uh, well, first of all, why do we care to, to show that? Uh, I mean, backprop is really the workhorse of the success of machine learning these days. And, uh, you know, it would be surprising that the brain wouldn't be using at least some kind of uh, similar underlying principle. So I think it's, it's worth asking the question. And maybe the brain is doing something better. All right, so, so why, is, why is backprop not biologically plausible? Well, um, uh, one particular aspect that we focused on is that if you look at the forward computation versus the backward computation, uh, it's not at all the same type of computation. The nonlinearities are not the same. In fact, in, in, in the uh, backprop, it's all linear, but we use a, a different kind of nonlinearity that we multiply. Uh, another issue is what's called the weight transport, that uh, the, the forward and backward phase, you, you can think of them as like two different networks that, that share the same weights. Uh, you know, uh, one has sort of symmetric uh, weights compared to the other. Uh, another sort of uh, practical thing in terms of hardware implementation is that uh, when we do experiments, we find that the, the, the amount of precision that you need in the forward pass versus the backward pass are not at all the same. So we need something like one bit uh, per activation in the forward pass, whereas we need at least six bit in the backward pass, and that's using a, an appropriate representation, something like a log representation. 
So, um, so the equilibrium propagation is uh, an approach to train a particular kind of uh, neural net called energy-based models in which the computation corresponds to minimizing an energy function. Uh, energy-based models uh, have been known for a long time, and uh, if you think about RBMs, for example, there are a particular kind of energy-based models. Uh, what uh, energy-based models training usually amounts to is changing the energy function uh, so the energy function is, think of it as something virtual that um, the network um, uh, changes during training and that defines the behavior of the network. Uh, and essentially the idea is the network likes low energy configurations. And by changing the energy landscape, you, you make the behavior of the network change so that it prefers some configurations which correspond to good behavior and it avoids configurations corresponding to bad behavior. Uh, so training consists in reducing the energy of good behaviors corresponding to data and augmenting the energy of, of bad ones. Um, and one thing that is uh, also relevant here is that the way that the, that behavior is, is obtained in these kinds of models usually is through uh, iterating in order to search for a, a low energy uh, configuration. So it's not like... Uh, you do one pass in, in the network, you have some, some sort of uh, uh, gradient descent in energy. So the computation for uh, obtaining an answer requires uh, a number of iterations to find a low energy configuration or to sample from a low energy configuration if you look at the stochastic versions of this, like the RBM. All right. Um, so, so one, uh, if we go out of, uh, of, of machine learning, even uh, in the traditional sense, and uh, we think about physical systems that obey some kind of physical um, law, um, uh, like you know, have an energy function in where energy is in the physical sense. Um, and we ask the question, how could we train the parameters of such a system? How do we, could we tune the parameters of such a system so that its behavior would be better? Um, so, so now I'm gonna uh, be careful to distinguish two things that we, we have to keep in mind here. There is the energy function that I mentioned before uh, that is going to be minimized during inference. And there is a cost function, which is like your prediction error. These are two different things, right? This, is, this may be a little bit um, confusing, but the, the cost is, you know, after the system has settled into some configuration, how well does it predict uh, the right answer given the inputs? Whereas the energy function is a quantity that is being minimized um, uh, while I'm doing inference, the cost is something uh, I'm minimizing over training, right? So uh, during inference, the state changes to minimize the energy function, whereas during training, the weights change to minimize the prediction error, right, the costs. So you see these are two different things. One, one is optimized over the state of the model, and the other is optimized over the parameters. Um, so computing the gradient of the energy function with respect to the state is easy because that's what, you know, that's what the computation of the network does or the computation of the physical system does. Uh, but, uh, but the hard part is how do we convert uh, information about the cost into a gradient with respect to the parameters so that we can change the parameters and train the system. So we consider... Um, a fairly general situation where there is uh, an energy function, here we call it f, and um, inference corresponds to uh, gradually going to a local minimum of that energy function, so where the derivative of the energy with respect to the state is zero. And uh, that corresponds to uh, dynamics, so s dot here is ds dt uh, equal to zero. So s is a state, and when uh, it converges, it has found a local minimum of the energy function. That's a deterministic case. There's an equivalent formulation in the stochastic case where the system uh, dynamics converge not to a particular point but to a distribution which is uh, going to uh, be proportional to e to the minus energy. So this is a standard thing you find in, in like Boltzmann machines and things like that. But the, the two formulations are actually very closely related. Um, so, in the equilibrium propagation paper, we propose um, a general approach to obtain the gradients of the uh, prediction error with respect to the parameters. And the way we do that is we introduce this uh, fairly simple intuitive idea that we're going to um, 
have our system um, uh, behave in two different ways. One, which is sort of when the system is making a prediction, when it's being used for inference. Uh, and in that case, we don't tell it what the right answer is, of course, because it, it shouldn't have that information. It may have the X, but it doesn't have the Y. Uh, and the system here, for example, think about a, a neural net that has both feedback a uh, feed forward and feedback connection, so it's really a recurrent net, and we're going to let it converge to a fixed point that minimizes this energy function. So what we can do is we can decompose the energy function into two parts, uh, one part of which, which is going to be zero when, um, when we don't know the right answer, we, we don't know the why, and, uh, and one part which is going to be minimized when we do inference. So the idea is that we're going to um, let the system make a prediction, and then we're going to nudge it towards a better answer. In other words, we're going to put pressure on the, the, the network uh, prediction so that they look more like the correct answer. So that the internal Ys will want to match the uh, predicted Ys. Uh, so we have this extra uh, energy term that we're going to add a little bit of, which says, say, you know, prediction should be close to target, say, in squared error sense. And, and we have this quantity beta, which controls how much uh, you know, nudging, how much push we're going to put on the network so that its output is now closer to the right answer. And if we make just a small nudge, an infinitesimal nudge, actually, and we see how the network reacts and uh, the new minimum that it finds after we've sort of pushed the output towards the right answer, because of the feedback connections, the network is going to adapt. And not just the output is going to change, but all the hidden layers are going to change slightly towards a configuration which is slightly more compatible with the right answer. And the difference in the state of the system between uh, before we nudge it and after we nudge it is actually going to give us the gradient. So we have this theorem that uh, I'm not going to go into details, but basically says we can look at two quantities, which are the sufficient statistics of the energy function, before we nudge and after we nudge and take the difference and actually, that is going to give us the gradient of the prediction cost with respect to the parameters. Um, so this is a, a, a fairly simple formula, actually, uh, which tells us um, how to change the weights so that we do gradient descent on the prediction costs, uh, not, not the energy function. So we've, um, we've done a few experiments with this uh, on, on fairly simple networks, uh, plain MLPs without regularization, and, and we're able to, to get the networks to, to, to be trained to something like zero training error. Uh, the validation error is still you know, higher than, than what you get with a standard network. We don't completely understand why, but, but it's, it's decent like in, in a 2% uh, error range. So, so why is that interesting? Um, and, and now I'm going to start connecting with sort of analog circuit design. Uh, typical analog circuits are not used uh, very much uh, these days for a number of reasons. Uh, and basically, it's, uh, it's hard to make them do the things we want. Like if we want them to do a particular uh, multiplication or an addition, uh, they're not going to do it perfectly. Um, they might be doing it approximately right in some uh, regime of the, the, the values of the, the currents and the voltages, and uh, and also different uh, and so so this will actually require a lot of energy to make them do the right you know keep them in the right uh, regime, uh, and also different uh, instances of your multiplication device in, in analog or addition device in analog um, will uh, behave slightly differently right so when when you actually implement uh, a, in hardware uh, at the analog level there will be some small differences, which uh, from the point of view of designing a, like a neuromorphic chip or a neural net shows up as low precision, in fact, very low precision. Um, so how could we get around all of these uh, issues? Because uh, the potential of, uh, advantage of using analog is that we can have much smaller uh, circuits that uh, could uh, use much, much less energy. And so, so the idea that I'm putting forward is that we could train these, think of the analog circuit as a dynamical system that has three parameters and uh, that computes something nonlinear. And now the question is, how do we tune those parameters so that the overall circuit does the job we want, that it, you know, it classifies uh, image net images uh, properly? So uh, instead of uh, starting from an equation that we have that says you know, uh, weighted sum, blah, 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 rectifier, blah, 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 
Um, and then tuning the parameters uh, and then trying to implement those operations in hardware, why don't we take the kinds of computations that hardware can do, which is sort of some nonlinear variant of multiplications, additions, and, and, and whatever, um, and actually optimize the parameters so that the hardware we actually have physically is doing the thing we want. Uh, so that's sort of a, a radical departure from the usual way of thinking about designing analog hardware. Um, so I want to mention a few more things. Uh, there's a special case of the energy function which actually implements the equivalent of a feedforward net. So, so if we wanted, uh, if we are able to implement something like, like this energy function which says simply, you know, uh, the output of a layer uh, as computed by the, the, um, uh, the, the, the network should match uh, what the, the next layer is using as input, right? So, so the difference with the neural net, the usual neural net here is we think of the hidden units as free variables that are going to change during inference. And then we are asking ourselves, you know, what kind of, um, um, what kind of inference is needed to, to get there. Here it's fairly trivial. Uh, but, you know, what kind of, how could we implement that in, in something like analog hardware that, that may use the dynamics of the, of the electronics to actually do the computation? Um, I mentioned the connection to biology, so let me just say a few words that if you use a particular energy function, which looks a little bit like the Boltzmann machine energy function um, or the Hopfield uh, energy function, you can actually, uh, and if you apply equilibrium propagation, the, the gradient update now actually starts looking a lot like um, the uh, spike timing dependent plasticity updates, uh, assuming you do the right thing in the outer loop of uh, first um, letting the system make a, a prediction and then, and then nudging the outputs. And while uh, we're looking at the system changing after the, the, the nudging, we do these updates. Um, so, um, yeah, let me just go directly to what we're currently doing. Uh, there are some limitations to uh, the, the current theory. It requires an actual energy function to exist. And in, if you're looking at uh, electrical circuits, uh, there is a, an energy function uh, but, uh, you know, because the circuit is all, all, always uh, driven by, by, um, by electrons coming from your, your battery, it, you, know, it, it, you know, the electrons never uh, converge uh, in terms of their uh, physical energy, you know, their position and speed and so on doesn't converge. Uh, what does converge are uh, quantities like um, voltages and currents. And it's, it's not totally clear that in, in this domain there is an energy function, like a Lyapunov function. So that's, that's a challenge, and we're, we're, we have now a new version of the theory which eliminates the need for an explicit energy function and just talks about having some kind of dynamics and then thinking of, uh, and the dynamics of course converges somewhere, uh, how do we tune the parameters so that uh, at the place where it's converged, uh, it will behave in the way that we want. That also nicely gets rid of the problem of symmetric weights, which uh, uh, is, of course, a problem for brains, but it's also a problem for uh, analog implementation because you need to have some kind of communication at a distance between two parts of the network uh, if you want to implement the, those uh, symmetric weights. Uh, and we're also working on generalizing these kinds of ideas to unsupervised learning, but, of course, I won't have time to talk about that. Um, so thank you very much, and here's a picture of some of the people in, in, uh, in my group. Thanks. So we have time for some questions. Hi. Um, I, you mentioned that you had a 0% validation error. Um, is there a reason? Uh, no, that was training error. Training error. Oh, I, I see. Uh, are, you, are you at all concerned about overfitting? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it turns out here and in many other cases that the best validation error is obtained at 0% training error, or close to. Uh, this is sort of a, a mystery that many people are studying in the community right now. Uh, in fact, you know, how come we have these huge networks 
that are way over parameterized and, and generalized pretty well. Uh, I think that's, uh, we have some, a recent paper in that direction and then there's like, I think a lot of open questions to answer this, but it's not an uncommon thing. Yes. Uh, Yosho, hi. Yes, uh, hi. And I wanted to find out what you think about uh, predict predictive networks. This network that have uh, predicting can predict at every layer what the representation will be, and when you can predict, basically you can compute a local gradient for every layer. Uh, you you mean that at each layer you predict what the target will be? Yes. Ah. Uh, um, so there's some work like that from Brain Corporation or predictive coding in neuroscience. Right. I don't yes. believe this will go anywhere. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's a short answer. The long answer is the, I mean, you, you can have skip connections. That's, you know, very powerful. But you also need a training procedure, you know, like backprop, which is able to propagate credit through many layers, right? So all these local learning rules that basically uh, only tune uh, one layer with respect to its immediate use for classification and not how it could be used by other layers later for, for some you know, later purpose, uh, they're missing the boat. Uh, and precisely what we're trying to do with equilibrium prop and things like this is have a local update, but yet uh, has the effect of globally optimizing your prediction error with respect to you know, the final computation end to end. Thanks. All right, so I was going to ask if you if you have an, an analog system and you sort of looking at the arbitrary energy of it, or dynamics of it, yeah, um, and and you sort of discarded primitives or operations that you want to implement, and you're just kind of looking at the dynamics of the system. Yeah, what are the parameters that you change? Like, what are the physically realizable things about that circuit system that you would change? Well, uh, you have to ask the analog guys, but I imagine <laughs> that uh, say you have some transistor, and uh, you know you could put in some, some, some current in, in the gate, and, and that could be uh, something you control that's gonna change the behavior of the system, right? So any, anything that uh, you can control from outside or from some stored value, so there's the mm -hmm. issue of storage, right? So this right. doesn't eliminate the problem of how do you store parameters? Uh, right now, my you know, imagined solution is, well, we actually have still the need for digital hardware for storage at high precision. Because one thing I didn't mention in the first part of my presentation is that the, even though we, we uh, quantize heavily the weights um, at, at inference, I mean, or even during training, as far as the, the other neurons see those weights as, as binary, but, but when we train, uh, we have to store those weights at high precision, like you know, at least 16 bits. Uh, and if we don't do that, it doesn't work for a very, very good reason because training is a process of, with, with stochastic gradient descent, is the process of accumulating small changes, right? So you add a large thing with a small thing, you need precision. There's no way around that. And so in, in those kinds of uh, analog systems I talk about, you would also need to store the parameters somewhere. And so right now our best bet is some kind of digital storage. So you'd need to convert that on the fly into analog as the network is being run, which is probably gonna be where the biggest uh, energy draw will be. Thanks. Uh, but people are creative. Maybe some, someone will come up with low energy storage anyways. <laughs> yeah. A uh, question on the, so, so the process seem, as I understand it, seems to be imparting some small impulse response to the system and observing the dynamics, right? What's the uh, Not impulse response, just a, a small push. A small push. Yeah. So yeah. what are the strategies of picking what gets changed and... Oh, I mean, you have some outputs and you have some targets. And so you push the outputs towards the targets, which is mathematically corresponding to do one small gradient step towards... Uh, you know, minimizing that prediction error in the space of the outputs. So you do like gradient descent of the cost in the space of the outputs, and you do one small step, and then now you've nudged the output towards a slightly better value, but because of the feedback weights, this will be propagated to the low layers and propagated and so on, just in, in actually a way that's, that mimics backprop, which we showed uh, last year, and that's how it works. Okay, but in the case of an image sensor, let's say that's the input of a network, would you change one pixel? No, no, we're talking about the outputs. You would change? The outputs, we don't change the inputs. Uh. I mean, we don't care about the, I mean, we, we care about the inputs, but we're not trying to change the inputs. We're trying to change the outputs. The behavior of the system is how it maps inputs to outputs, right? So 
uh, if uh, the outputs are not right because there's an error, then you'd like to change the outputs. You don't want to change the inputs. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the similarities between this kind of approach and the synthetic gradient approach where you would um, have modules that would explicitly uh, compute gradients locally. Right, right. So um, I think it's a completely orthogonal thing and I'm, we are you know, very excited about synthetic gradients. Uh, uh, we actually started uh, this thing years ago and failed to make it work. So, you know, we're happy that the DeepMind guys made it work. Um, and I think it's actually also important in the exploration of learning procedures that could be biologically plausible because m according to, you know, my look at the timing issues, there's not enough time in the brain for doing a lot of back and forth. Uh, you know, from the time you have an image coming to your retina, to the time you're pressing a button uh, to take a decision, there's really not enough time uh, to do the kind of thing that we think would be necessary for, say, doing a backprop update. And so uh, it would make sense that uh, at least some of the updates be done immediately locally. Uh, and so something like synthetic gradients could be actually important in the search for biologically plausible explanations for learning at a large scale. Okay, thank you very much. Um.